This morning we're continuing our series on better things. You ready for better things in life? I think that most of us can look at life and say, yeah, it'd be awesome if there were some better things. So there's awesome things to be thankful for, and we need to be thankful people. Yeah. We're coming up to the time when in the United States we take one day a year to be thankful for things. But as Christians, we should be leading the way the other 364 days of the year. Amen. Okay? Yes. We can be thankful people. But the better things that we're speaking of this morning are better things because Jesus came. Because Jesus fulfilled the whole law. All that we read in the Old Testament, all the promises, all that God told His people He would do, He fulfills through Jesus Christ. And the church, larger than just the Jews... But the church who includes, which includes all those who believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. So we're going to go through quite a few things this morning. There are some big words we'll go through. There are some, term, some terminology that you'll, that you'll want to know. But these are things that go beyond a basic understanding. But they're things that are important for us as Christians to follow after Christ and to know why we follow and what we follow. Stand with me, please, as we turn first to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll read verses 1 through 15 together. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. We're continuing this discussion. Remember, we got the foundation things, so that we can go on beyond the foundation to teach others who he is and what he's done. All right? Verse 1, chapter 9. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances or rites or rituals of divine service and a worldly or material or earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, a tent. The first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary or holy place. And after the second veil... The tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or the holy of holies, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot speak now particularly or in detail. Now when these things were thus ordained or prepared, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing or performing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest or made known, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect or complete as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal or earthly fleshly ordinances or regulations imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and, of, and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth or set apart to the purifying or cleansing of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot or fault to God, 
purge or cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, his death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak your words into our hearts. Help us to comprehend the depth of what you need us to comprehend, that we might be your faithful people living in obedience to you. Anoint these lips, I pray. Anoint our ears that we might hear and our hearts that we might understand and respond. For it is in your precious holy name, Jesus, we pray all of these things. Amen. You may be seated. Move over to chapter 10. Chapter 10, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers therein too perfect or complete. For then would they not cease to be offered? Because the worshippers once purged or cleansed should have no more conscience or awareness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Jump down to verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected or completed forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering or sacrifice for sin. No more sacrifice required. Now, let's learn a few things this morning. Okay? You've got an extra piece of paper in your bulletin with some lines on the back of it. You can take some notes if you would. We're talking about the fact that through Jesus Christ, He has become a greater and more perfect tabernacle. You remember the Old Testament tabernacle was set up according to God's plan, but God himself said it is a pattern representing things in heaven. All right? So we're going to talk about some of those things this morning. In the Mosaic Law, sacrifice had three central ideas. Here are three of your big words. Consecration expiation, big word, which means covering of sin, and propitiation, meaning satisfaction of divine anger. Consecration means something given over to a specific purpose that's consecrated, given over to God. That's what consecration means. And then expiation is the covering of sin. And propitiation is the satisfaction of divine anger. For remember, sin separates us from God. From the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, mankind and their generations were separated from a holy, righteous God. But God did not want us to be separated, so He has made the way for us to come back to Him. Those three things, consecration, expiation, and I just forgot the next word. Propitiation. Some of these words zoom in and out of my head like nobody's business. Sacrifice as worship required man to give back to God what God had given to him. You see, sacrifice as worship and in the New Testament, we're told that we are a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Sacrifice as worship is the way mankind recognizes that everything is from God. And he has every right to expect us to live after his plan. Okay? We give back what he had given to us. Now, we get to some specifics here. Here's a, a model of the tabernacle. 
All right? Now, out here, you have the brazen altar, the brazen labor. That, they're brass. That's the brazen part. They're made of brass. Now, this is the altar where the sacrifices were made, the sacrifices of, of bulls and goats and all of those things. This is out in the desert. Now, this gives you a, a, an idea. This is an, the size of an American football field up here. This is the size of the temple and the temple court, or the tabernacle and the tabernacle court right here. Okay? Probably pretty close to the same to the size of the end zone of a football field, of an American football field. Okay? Pretty, pretty close to that size. All of this stuff was packed up, loaded, and moved every time the pillar of a cloud or the pillar of fire moved on. Because that was God's presence with them saying it's time to move, it's time to go. And it was used during the 40 years of the wandering around in the desert, recognizing, realizing, and learning to trust God. Alright? Now, we're going to talk about these sacrifices first. The brazen altar is where the sacrificial offerings were made. Now, those can be broken into several categories, but here are the four major categories for the burnt offerings. And there's a reason that we should understand these things, okay? The burnt offering originally was a payment for sin. Because mankind had sinned, we made a sacrifice of something else to God in payment for our sin. Well, it pointed to Christ's atoning death on the cross for sinners like us. And his total consecration or giving himself over to God's purpose, to the Father's purpose. Okay? Second type of the four offerings. The meal offering or meat offering symbolized presenting the first fruits of human living to God. There's a reason that we talk about tithing off of the, the top. We talk about giving our first fruits to God. It is a recognition that the human effort, the human life and living that we live has rewards. And we offer a portion of that to God as an offering from our first fruits. Right? Third. The peace offering. It was an offering that celebrated the covering of sin. That our sins are covered. And that we have received forgiveness from God. And a restoration of the right relationship with God. Okay? We need to be on the same page. Because we have to understand these things. To fully comprehend what Christ has done. And how he fulfills the whole law. You do realize that the whole law in the Old Testament is centered around the tabernacle and the tabernacle court. It is the law. In a lot of ways, God represented the things that he expected by this tabernacle. And as we understand it, we can begin to fully comprehend, hopefully, all that God has done for us through Christ Jesus, our Savior. Finally, the fourth one was the sin offering. Guilt for the worshiper's sin was transferred symbolically by laying on of hands. Remember several weeks ago we talked about laying on of hands. This is symbolically laying our sin on the sins of someone else. And so the New Testament reminds us to come to Christ and to lay our lives, a living sacrifice, at His feet. That we would symbolically lay our sin on Him. That's why we have an altar here. We call this an altar or a kneeling bench. It's where we come in humbleness and say, I need you to take my sin. Okay? So, these substitutes pointed forward to the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ who laid down his life for the sins of all people. Now, if we can begin to comprehend those kinds of things, we begin to understand why Christ died on the cross. But not just the cross. 
we begin to understand what God is asking of us and how we come to Him to comprehend what He's doing. Okay, so let's move inside the tabernacle. All right? Here's the tabernacle. This is a beautiful representation, by the way. When I found this one, I was really glad. Uh, I was really excited about it. It kind of explains all of those things that we see in the Old Testament or we read those words and we kind of go, and you put this part with this part and blah, 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 blah. How many more verses are there? And we've, we stop comprehending. Well, this is a beautiful rendition of, of what God had said. These are... Uh, ornamental curtains. They're woven with purple and, and scarlet and there are, are pictures of cherubim on those. Well, they cover the whole tabernacle on the inside. And they, these two veils are here. They cover the, this is a cutaway version just so you recognize that. Um, but on top of that, there were three different types of animal skins laid over that. All right, And all of these pillars, all of these Bars and things are overlaid with gold because the thing that mankind recognizes as most valuable is rightly used to honor God. Right? The things that we count as most valuable are rightly used to honor God. So we're going to go inside here. First, we see what you might recognize as a menorah. It's the golden candlestick. All right? Then we have the table and the showbread. We'll talk about each of these in a moment. Then we have the altar of incense. And then we have inside the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubim there on top. Okay? The otherwise known as the mercy seat. Right, let's talk about each of those and why they're important. The candlestick, those lamps, those lights were always burning. The only time they weren't burning was when they were switching it out so they could continue. All right? It was providing light. Have you ever thought about the fact that there are no windows in the tabernacle? You've got purple and scarlet cloth. You've got this type of animal skin. You've got this second type of animal skin. You've got this third type of animal skin. You have, in essence, a tent, four tents, dark inside, except for the candles. These candles pierce the darkness and light the way into this holy place. You might recognize there are three terms that Jesus used about himself, that he is the way, the flashlight, the way that people find, the way that they can find where they're going, the truth, and the light, the life. So, let's move forward just a little bit. By the light from Christ, Matthew Henry says, we must have communion with Him and with one another. It is through the light of Christ in our life that allows us to truly participate in communion with Him and with others. Then we move to the table of showbread. The bread on it represented the twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve tribes from Jacob. And it represented God's provision that God would provide for them, that God would continue to provide for them. It was a reminder. This bread was changed each week. A reminder that God would always provide, which is the truth. It is the truth of the gospel. We must not come in the dark to His table, but by light from Christ must discern the Lord's body. This may take a little bit of wrapping your head around, okay? We don't come in darkness to His table of provision, to where He provides. We come by His light. 
But we come by His light so that you and I can discern, can understand, can comprehend, can see that this is indeed our Lord. That we be not deceived. That we don't say, well, you know, that sounds good enough. It needs to be Jesus. Not just good enough, not some way, but the way, the truth, the life. Let's move to the altar of incense here in a moment. Sorry, got one more. The provision made in Christ for the souls of His people. That's what this showbread is. That's what it represents. That Jesus is giving His life, His Body. Remember, he used that symbolism at the Last Supper. This is my body given for you. souls doesn't get to decide whether or not I speak. That's not up to him. Itching, broken microphone clip, doesn't matter. He doesn't get to decide. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He gave himself for us. But Matthew Henry puts it this way. In our Father's house there is bread enough and to spare. Yes. He has enough for all of us, for each of us, for every one of us. We come to the altar of incense. That represented the fragrant offering of love and worship of the offerer. A fragrant offering. The Old and New Testaments use that terminology. That our lives are to be a fragrant offering to Him. An offering of love and worship and honor. Lord, You are worthy of praise. The altar of incense is a symbol of honest and sincere prayer. The Father can only be approached through sincere prayer. Now, over the years, I've always reminded people, God has not obligated Himself to hear any prayer of a sinner except the one that prays for forgiveness. Because He has obligated Himself to hear the prayers of His people. To answer the prayers of His people. And he says that we are to bring no strange incense. On this altar, there was to be no strange incense. No incense that he had not ordained. And we're reminded that he can only be approached through sincere prayer from his people who are sincere in their heart toward him. Any other petition unto him is equivalent to offering strange incense incense. And that was one of the things that really upset him. Because the Jews started doing that eventually. They would offer incense to other gods. And hey, it's a great place to honor this god. And a great place. Then you've stopped honoring the god. Honest and sincere prayer that we offer to God. And then we move through the veil. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. But on the other side of the veil is the Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant overlaid with gold. And it contained these things you saw there. The, the pot with the golden pot with the manna, a sample of the manna in there. Remember, they weren't supposed to keep any in their homes. It would get rancid and have worms in it. But they placed it here in the Ark. Ark of the Covenant in the Ark because this is where God said to place it as a, as a reminder of what He had done in the desert and it lasted. Aaron's rod that, that budded, this was the rod that he and Moses used so often 
And that the reason that it budded was because God was pointing out who he was going to speak through when there was such a controversy. And they said, what makes you better than us? What makes you good enough to speak for God? God took the dead stick and caused it to come to life and begin to bud and blossom. That's inside the Ark of the Covenant as well. This is also known as the mercy seat, the throne of God. Remember, I've spoken about this before, that God inhabits the space between. This is not God. This is not an idol representing God. It is instead something that represents that He is present always. Beyond the veil, this separating curtain. Remember when Jesus said it is finished on the cross. That one of the gospel writers reminds us that the veil, this inner veil, was torn from the top to the bottom. And now the way was opened up for us to come into the presence of a holy God through Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Beyond the veil, Jesus Christ, we enter into the Holy of Holies where we can offer a peace offering of a right relationship to God, a sweet-smelling savor to God, where we come into His presence recognizing who He is, recognizing the only access, the only way we have to that is Jesus Christ Himself who gave Himself as a sacrifice for us. The pattern of things in the heavens were merely a shadow of good things to come. They were not the very image of the things. The tabernacle and all of its accoutrements, all of the things that went along with it, were a shadow of things to come. Things which Jesus Christ fulfilled. He fulfills all the meanings, all the symbolism, all the requirements of the law for a sinful man or woman. Through Him we have access to the better things. Through Him we have access. Through Him He has provided the sacrifice where we placed our sins on Him. Through Him we are made clean and able to walk by His light into God's provision into a thankful relationship with God where we can pray and speak to Him and He hears us because we are His. My sheep know my voice. And we can stand in the presence of a holy, righteous God through the holiness, through the sacrifice of of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. There is no other way. That's not prejudice. That's not hatred. There is one way to the holy God. It is through Jesus Christ and His sacrifice. He fulfilled all the law. And we see as we look at the tabernacle how He fulfilled all of these requirements to bring mankind back into a relationship with the Holy God. Where He would write His law on our hearts. Where we would know when we're following Him and when we're walking away from Him. Where we would understand through His Holy Spirit's influence on us, the way to walk, how to live. We come through Jesus Christ and through Him alone into the better things. This deep and abiding relationship, this relationship where we can call on Him for strength, this relationship where we can know that He hears us, this relationship where He provides, this relationship that He so desperately wants to have with us because we matter to Him. We've always mattered 
to him. Jesus is the one we need. He's the answer. Whatever the problem is, Jesus is the answer. It's not that he gives us answers, because we don't always get the kinds of answers that will satisfy our curiosity. God, why did you take this person? God, why did you do this? Or why did you do that? He doesn't answer those questions the way that we think he should. But he is the answer. For in a relationship with him, recognizing, remember the temple, or the tabernacle, recognizing that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, that we belong to him, that we were bought with a price, that this representation of what is in heaven shows us that when we come before him, we come before him recognizing that he is God above all. And that he deserves our worship. He deserves our sacrifice. He deserves because he is the almighty God. And he provides for us what we cannot provide for ourselves. Over and over Day after day, week after week, year after year, the priests brought these things before a holy God. But they never fully cleaned them because they had to keep doing them over and over and over. We come through Jesus Christ into the throne room of the holy God. Clean by His cleansing power. Not clean today, but not tomorrow, but clean, clean, cleansed, purified, completed, perfected through Jesus Christ alone. The second person of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Trinity, the three in one. Don't try to fully comprehend it. It is no easier to fully comprehend than it is to understand that God has no beginning and no end. That He always has been and always will be. We can't fully comprehend what it means to live for eternity. That goes both directions in our concept. But the triune God, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is a holy and righteous God. Mankind is the one that He created to have relationship with. And through sin, we walked away from that. And every generation bears that sin. So in order to come back to God, we must be righteous and holy. But it is impossible for us. So we can only do that through Jesus Christ who made the way for us through His sacrifice. And it's all that was needed. It's enough. He said on the cross, it is finished. Amen. The job is done. The way is made. And so the gospel writer reminds us that during the time when we thought he, when his body was in the tomb, he was going into the very gates of hell to take the keys of the kingdom and to say, you no longer have the strength and power over my creation. Amen. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. But He wants us to come. He doesn't hold it in reserve for only a few. He doesn't hold it for only those who look a certain way. He offers it to all. That's right. Why would we not want people to know that? Stand with me if you would, please.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank You so much for who You are. Thank You for making a way for us when we simply could not ever make a way.